You're tuned into the Writing Community Chat Show, the live streaming YouTube podcast that brings you the stories of authors, screenwriters, and more. Indie or established, this show's for the community, and we invite you to be a part of it. Head to the Writing Community Chat Show.com for more info. The WCCS, together as one, we get it done. Hi, my name is Chris, and you are watching the Writing Community Chat Show. Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's show. It is the final show of season nine, which is pretty incredible. I can't really believe it's here. Uh, and that means there has been over 217 episodes now on this show in kind of two and a half years or a little bit more than that now, I think. Um, but don't worry, we're only breaking for a week for season nine at the end of that until season 10 starts. And there are some big and better changes coming for the show. Um, a little change to the format, perhaps, and some new questions in there, but also a very big surprise uh, for you guys. Um, and of course, you might notice the show is back on a Friday night. There's a poll running there to see if you like that or not. Um, a few people said that Friday night makes more sense going back what the show used to be like. Uh, a bit more fun and um, there'll be definitely a few surprises for you next season so make sure you subscribe and shameless plug here uh, the YouTube channel is now on 891 subscribers which for me is amazing uh, I can't kind of believe that which is just nine off 900 and when we hit 900 there will be a giveaway I'll buy some books on social media and uh, that is 109 off the absolute massive milestone of 1000 subscribers so if you um, haven't subscribed, please consider doing so. And if you're a podcast listener, thank you very much. And of course, you can jump over there and hit subscribe if you like to, even if you're not going to watch it very often. That will really help us out. So get in there. Very close to that thousand, which is super, super cool. Um, again, if you are a podcast listener, thank you so much. And if you tune in live, uh, you guys are amazing as well. Love you, your questions. And of course, tonight you can put those questions in the chat throughout. And there is a des designated time at the end for your questions as well. Um, but I'm not going to ramble on too much tonight because we've got a great guest and I want to bring them on. Uh, hello, Leah, to you. Hello, by the way. Nice to see you in the chat. Um, fantastic to have you here. Um, and uh, everybody else that's tuning in, thank you for doing so. So let me get on tonight's guest because I don't want to waste our time. Like I said, there's going to be a lot to talk about. Uh, tonight's guest is the author of many children's books and uh, also fiction novels for adults and non-fiction as well. She has written and released over 60 books, which is just amazing. Um, she has won the Dorothy Canfield Fisher Award and the Penn Syndicated Fiction Award. And her children's book in particular, Castles in the Attic, is widely used in schools as well. Um, and as well as some of her other books are used in book clubs too. Um, and in 2017, she performed her very own TED Talk, which I've watched and is fantastic, about creative life and writing. Um, that's worth checking out. And she is the daughter of the journalist Stuart Alsop and the great niece of Theodore Roosevelt, which is just an incredible thing to hear. Um, she is here today, today pro sorry, can't get my words out, today promoting her family biography, which is called The Daughter of Spies. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Elizabeth Winthrop Alsop. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi, I'm glad to be here, Chris. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Um, it's a real pleasure for you to come and, and to share your story with us and uh, get into your, your new book, which looks incredible. Um, and there's a lot of history there I kind of mentioned at the start. But first of all, how are you doing? How is life for Elizabeth at the moment? And of course, your recent release as well. So things are obviously quite busy at the moment. So I should tell you, there's a kind of a feedback and I'm hearing everything you're saying about three seconds after you're saying it mm. oh dear okay um you haven't got any other tabs open at the moment have you no i don't think so um okay. maybe if i take my airpods off would that make a difference uh quite possibly um i'm not sure you could go in your settings and there's an echo thing there is that better and you've muted yourself as well <laughs> okay guys we're obviously having some technical issues here i do apologize um elizabeth you've mu muted yourself i'm not sure how that's happened could be to do with your ear pods all right guys if you're watching this whilst we sort this out um let me know how your week's been 
and stick it in the chat and we will get some of those um, some of those in bits of information up and we'll talk about that um, Elizabeth on your screen there's a little microphone with a cross in it if you can click that it should be in the bottom of your screen Nope. Um, <laughs> I do apologize, guys. It's the way of live, live TV. Uh, it's the way it goes sometimes. Yeah, let us know how you're doing in the chat, and I will get back to you with some questions. Whilst Elizabeth tries to fix this, um, I can't do much but direct you. In the bottom, you should see a little picture of yourself, and there should be a, a settings button, and you should be able to unmute your microphone there, and there might be an echo cancellation there. That is probably the only thing I can think of. Yes, so as I was saying, uh, season 10, there are some big changes coming. I really want to tell you what the big surprise is, but I, I've got to have to wait. So in just two weeks' time, two weeks today, there will be a, um, a brand new episode for season 10 with some changes involved and a big surprise. Uh, are you celebrating Halloween this weekend? That's what I want to know, which is, in fact, it's on Monday. Uh, but do remember the clocks go back on Sunday evening in the UK. Um, not sure what time that takes effect in... Um, for you guys uh so yeah I'll, I'll be at halloween party on monday and in fact i did enter a competition um which a local newspaper uh, online newspaper has given away the chance to review films on halloween so i'll be trying to do that as well if they allow me to we'll see what happens with that i guess elizabeth has now dropped off screen i'm not sure where she's gone but clearly technical issues there and um, so there you go um leah says busy here plotting for nana rimo and drawing a lot of stuff. Uh, yes, we know you draw a lot of stuff, which is really cool, by the way. Um, if I remember back, Leah draw us a, um, a goat back in the day. And NaNoWriMo, if you're doing that, let us know how it's going. Um, interesting. Or how it will be going. Uh, I did that once and it was quite intense, but it was definitely rewarding. Elizabeth, have we got you? You've got me back. I'm still hearing all the repeats, so I'm just going to try and go through it. In your settings at the bottom... Yeah. If you click on that, there should be an uh, an echo setting, like a, a tick box. Try and tick that if you can. That might help. Um, it says the settings say mute, stop cam, settings. Let me look at settings. Okay, which one do I tick? The uh, is is there or... one that says um, echo cancellation on it? Uh, la, la, la. audio echo let's try echo is that worked okay so the echo cancellation is now unticked is it working now yeah i think it's yeah. better hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay cool so we are now chatting uh, and it sounds okay to you so that's a good thing so um, what I was saying was, it's amazing to have you on the show. And of course, um, there is a lot of kind of backstory there um, in regards to your family history and Daughter of Spies as well. But you've been, how are you at the moment? How are things with your recent release as well? Um, yeah. No? I'm still hearing what you said three minutes ago. I'm so oh, sorry, dear. but it's just not. All right. It's, it... um, speak again, Chris. Let's see if this works. <laughs> uh, I said, uh, how are things uh, for yourself at the moment with your release yeah. and, and just in general? Yeah, lots of echo. It's echoing. So I don't know if I could try and just ignore it and go through it. It's probably not worth ignoring. Um, I'm not sure why that's happening because it was fine before we started. You definitely don't have like another tab open with YouTube or anything that on there, do you? So you're not playing yourself in a video, if that makes sense. No, I mean another tab. You mean in terms of in terms of everything across the top? Mm-hmm of my let me just try and get rid of absolutely everything ah that helps i uh, nope still there is it 
still happening. Can you hear me outside of your earphones? Is it coming through the speaker as well? This is like a good technical video for people who are it's having It's just coming issues. through the AirPod. Okay. And I just closed all the tabs. Mm -hmm. That looks hopeful. That sounds hopeful. Is it okay? Speak to me, Chris. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. I think yes. I'm not getting a repeat. <laughs> oh, right. fantastic. There you go, guys. <laughs> Just close all your tabs if that's the case um yeah elizabeth uh, thank you again and and how are you doing yourself apart from our technical issues which yes. we all get don't worry about that um but in general you've had a recent release and um just in life in general how are you doing i'm doing fine as i said to you earlier i'm a little bit overwhelmed because you work on a book for 10 years and then there then you work to get it published and then in that last week it's like everything falls on your head and it and also, this is a memoir. So mm -hmm. always before, when I was writing fiction, I could say, well, that's the way my characters feel. Yeah, but in fact, it's it's me. I'm exposed Yeah. now. All my Would stories, you... all my faults, all my, anyway. So it's been a kind of an amazing new experience. For someone who's published as many books for as many years, this is new, which uh, is interesting. It feels very, very different. And of course, we'll get into that very soon but what i'd yeah. love to do and I'll, we lost a little bit of time but that's okay i know i want to rewind the tape back to the start or back to when writing became kind of a thing in your life because obviously there must have been a huge inspiration for you there to get a career lifted off like you have so i'll play a little video and then we'll get okay. stuck into that okay Okay, Elizabeth, um, could you let us know what kind of was your inspiration as a younger Elizabeth uh, for getting into writing in the first place and maybe some of the influences there? So the weird thing is my father was a writer. He was a mm -hmm. famous journalist. He worked at home. And we used to, I used to say that he had a sign on his door that said, please don't knock unless you're bleeding. Because there, <laughs> were, there were six kids in the house and he could not tolerate noise. Um, he was a journalist. He wrote with his brother for a while, and then he wrote for Saturday Evening Post and, and uh, Newsweek. Um, so I would come home every afternoon, and I would hear that typewriter going in the back room, and I would think, this, you know, this is a cushy job here. He doesn't go anywhere. He can sleep late. He doesn't have to go to the office. He just sits in the living room and talks to people who look kind of boring to me, whatever. <laughs> So I told him that he almost brained me with a typewriter. He said, wait, do you try? But always I wanted to write stories. I wanted to write fiction. I wasn't interested. I did try to be a journalist for a summer and I had a very good time, but I came away saying, not for me, I want to write fiction. And so I went to Sarah Lawrence College, which is fabulous for writers. And I wrote 250 short stories while I was there. One wow. got published, <laughs> just one. Wow. But I did keep going and ended up working in publishing and then began to write full time. Mm. So how, how were you feeling at the time when writing 250 short stories and, and having those rejections? Because so many people will go down that route anyway in all sorts of writing. Um, was there ever a doubt there that you felt this isn't for me or you, you knew that this, this was your path? The doubt came earlier when I wrote a book a story at the age of 12. I lived in Washington, D.C. My father was a journalist. He interviewed the president, all those people. And I wrote a book called The Mouse, Mice Who Lived in the White House. And I, in those days, no computer, no, I didn't even have a typewriter. I just hand wrote it in one of those composition books. And I thought the way you write a book is to make sure to end on the very last line of the very last page. I left it in the school bus. No. I never found it again. I was taking it to show it my teacher, and I thought, well, I think I'll be a tennis player. This is just too hard to write oh, this whole goodness. book and then lose it. Well, I wasn't that good a tennis player, so I went back <laughs> to writing in college. But I, I did learn the hard way that rejection is part of the program. And part of the best, the best thing to do is always have something out. Mm. So if you have four stories out and one gets rejected, you say, ah, well, so what? I have three others that might be accepted. But it isn't, it isn't an easy road. And, mm. and there was no self-publishing. So you were really dependent on, 
on people accepting your work. So it's hard. How, how did it work in that time then? Because obviously, as you mentioned with computers, like we do now, we can write a story, go to a publisher and they say these changes need to happen. We can make those changes. How did that work before that, that process was in place then? You used other people. You used your writer's community. You used, I, I actually met two friends in 1982 at a writer's conference and we exchanged manuscripts until one of them died. So, you know, 30, 40 years. Wow. And I trusted their word more than anybody. Mm. Once I got my foot in the door and was publishing, then I could go to the editor and say, even if you don't want this, tell me what to do. Tell me where, why you don't want it. But if you don't have that, you have writers' communities all over. A lot of people talk now about beta readers. That yeah. just sort of means, you know, the first level reader who you trust who's going to give you feedback. I've totally flipped the other way at, at, at this end of my career. I don't show it to anybody. And that's part of why this is so hard. I mean, I do, I do at the end when I'm finished my first draft and I need, I do get feedback, but it's not, I'm not in a writer's group. I don't send it out to beta readers. It's like, I kind of, clutch it to me and you know don't don't want anybody to read it and then it's because i think i'm i'm actually more thin-skinned than i used to be mm. so if i get a criticism that there are a lot of very good editorial criticisms that i love but if i get one that doesn't feel right to me it makes me doubt myself more than i used to which is yeah. an odd thing um at the end of this career and of course you mentioned how writing a biography is very, very different to what you've written in the past. So that criticism now could feel a whole lot different to what it used to be, right? Exactly. And the other weird thing about writing a memoir is people will say to me, ask me a question about something, and I cannot honestly remember if it's in the book or if it's just that I lived it. Yeah. Whereas in fiction, I make up the whole thing. So I know you know, I know where it is in the book, etc. But this one is just, is a different experience. Mm. So, what book for you, uh, going back in your career, was one that kind of got more success than you kind of were used to, and really felt like, okay, this is the start of my career. Yeah, this it was the castle in the attic. It mm. just took off. It did not get blazing reviews. I tell this to every writer. You know, people were sort of ho hum about it. But the kids adopted it, and yeah. it was nominated for 23 state book awards. And that's what gets the book, because the kids vote. Mm. And as a result, it just kept building and building. And my editors were going, oh, my heavens, we never thought this would come to much. Um, so that one, I finally wrote a sequel uh, eight years after the first book was published. And then I just last just in July, finished the first draft of a prequel, mm. which again, I've been asked for a lot and I have a movie possibility. So yeah, it's, it's sort of the time for me to go back to that book. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I'm always interested when an author develops their career because as a writer, we always improve each time we write as well. That's right. So having that eight year gap, how did you feel of returning to that story? And did you feel like there was a challenge to kind of keep it matched the same kind of style? Great question. And now I hate to tell you, it's a 20, whatever, six year gap since I've been with those characters. I'm a different writer. Yeah. And even in the eight years, I'm a much, I'm a deeper writer. I'm a more, I develop character more uh, intuitively and subtly. Mm. And so the Battle for the Castle is a much more complicated book than The Castle in the Attic. And now the prequel I'm calling The Cradle in the Castle again. But my readers have grown up also. Yeah. So the kids who read in 2022 are not the kids who read in 1985. They're more sophisticated, they've seen more, and they, they want more depth mm -hmm. and complication. So in fact, I feel like we're together you know we've come along the road together yeah um, that's that's very interesting i mean did you actually feel like you had to change your writing approach then to suit the modern sort of young audience that you get writing towards ah, wow did i have to change no i think that having i've written two novels for adults also mm. so i've written fiction 
for adults. And I think that a lot of that became intuitive for me so that when I wrote this book, I knew that adults would appreciate it also. And that's the feedback I'm getting, which is, which is interesting. It's like, you know, E.T. Kids and adults love that movie. So yeah. you, you're always looking for that audience where somebody's not just going to diss it because it's a kid book. Mm. Um, it's very interesting. Yes, let's fly there. Um, yeah. When you go back to, say, your publishing career then, how much did you obviously you looked at it as as a as a growing author should looked at you know what do you want what do you need from me to make this work but how much did you kind of learn from them um professionally was there a lot of influence there that made you change your writing styles at that age from the readers or from, uh, from uh, the publishing industry from the publishing actually yeah. i think i taught myself in an odd way in that the castle in the attic was the first book I did not outline. Okay. Oh, and I had published, I'd published three or four novels before that. And I had this sort of fear, if I didn't write everything down, plot A, plot B, you know, that I would lose it. Castle in the Attic, I didn't do that. And look what happened. It was this mm -hmm. smashing success. So I thought, forget outlining. I'm not outlining anymore. And I really don't. Um, and I think the editors appreciate that. It's a more intuitive way to write. It's like the, the character leads you along. I always used to tell when I went out to, to um, schools to talk, I'd say that I come in my office here and it's as if my characters are on the couch saying, excuse yeah. me, where have you been? You know, what, what, why did you go out to breakfast? We're sitting here waiting for you. You know, they became so much more alive because I didn't outline them and I didn't nail them to the floor mm. so they could make different decisions and I just have to yeah. follow along. Um, I think that's how the writing changed and why that book was so successful. Mm. So in theory, you went from a plotter to a panster. Yeah, because mm -hmm. uh, that's mm -hmm. very much how I wrote uh, my, my work is I, I follow the characters like I was watching a visual. Good for you. And I really enjoyed that kind of process, whereas I... I tried to plot once because people talked about it mm -hmm. and I found that a stressful thing. So for me, the freedom of the characters is something that are amazing to, to write with. So um, if someone I guess is, is watching this or have, hasn't tried that, it might be worth doing so because it is quite freeing, as you mentioned. One um, thing I do is I do keep a journal of the book. So, yeah. you know, October 23rd, um, what is Richard doing in a bar? Why, why did I let him go in there? Wait a minute. You know, and I pull back and I kind of assess where I am, but mm. it doesn't mean I plot. It just means I'm reacting to where that character has led me, which may not be the right place for the structure yeah. of the book. But and of course, of course, if you're writing uh, a story which you then go back to years later, that diary yeah. is essential to remember what those crucial. characters are doing. Yeah, yeah, crucial. Tell me what your you you said a plotter versus a, a panster. What does that mean? So Is I that used Welsh? to. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Welsh. Um, I used to. I used to get mocked on this show because I used to call it a, um, a panther, um, oh. and people used to take. take oh. me. But a panther, by all accounts, is an opposite to a plotter, and it's someone who writes out the pants of their seats or something like oh, that. Oh, the seat of their pants. The seat right. of their pants. That's probably more uh, acceptable way of saying <laughs> that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, oh, it's that's more smart. It, it means basically we sit down and we write and we let our minds take take the story forward rather than structuring the plot like like most people do. Um, or it could be a panther who's stalking the characters. Exactly, a panther. <laughs> I think I'll stick to panther. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> that's great. Oh, that's my thought. Uh, yeah. So, um, so that's obviously a way that your process has changed over time as well. But. Have you got a tip for someone then who is just starting out on their sort of writing journey? What one tip would you give them uh, from your experience to, to make their process a bit easier? It's terrible to say, but everybody says it, ask to chair. So pick a time every day, even if it's 15 minutes, because you stay in touch with your work. And you, you, know, you can't say, mm. oh, I'm gonna wait for the muse to strike, forget it. You have to sit down and you have to do it. And then it becomes easier literally every day because the character is so familiar to you from yesterday, mm -hmm. from your 15 minutes. And that really, to me, that's what's stuck with me longer than anything. Yeah. 
that's a great tip. Um, mm. So what I'd like to know then is that you've had a few different genres that you've written in. First of all, why did you feel the need to kind of go from, say, young work to adult fiction and nonfiction? And is there any other uh, kind of genre that you're kind of thinking about? I think the thing I've always thought is that I would like to be writing more than one thing at a time. Mm. So the beauty is if you're writing a novel and you're writing a picture book, a picture book for children is 32 pages in book form, but in physical form, it might be two manuscript pages. It's the closest to poetry. You have to pull it way down. You have to give half of the story to the illustrator. They're gonna carry half the story. You don't dictate what they what they draw, um, and to have that happening while I'm writing in my mother's house, which was 770 pages, it's a lovely balance back and forth. So I wouldn't say that it's progressive. In other words, in the middle of writing this, I wrote a very short picture book um, for for kids called Lucy and Henry are twins. So it, it sort of hasn't gone like that. It's gone like this, you know, back mm -hmm. and forth. Um, I still, I miss picture books and I just got two new grandchildren. So I think my, I will hear the picture book voice again in my head. Um, but this, this memoir has taken me a long time. So mm -hmm. it's, it's been an interesting shift. Yeah. It's it's interesting with someone with so many books that they've they've got in their possession and released. It's like that old uh, tale where people say it's like asking what's your favorite child. But do you have a book yeah. that you kind of mo uh, most fond of? And was there one in particular that was very difficult? I would say William from Castle in the Attic sticks close to me. I don't. Mm. I have five brothers, no sisters. So you know, writing in the head of a of a of a male has never been particularly hard for me. Yeah. Um, the hardest book, not, uh, well, this is probably the memoir is the hardest book mm. to actually physically write. The one that was hard to deal with the material was a book I wrote called the, called Counting on Grace. And it's a historical novel about a little girl who worked in the mills of Vermont in 1910 at the age of 12. She worked uh, six days a week, 12 hours a day for $2 and 50 cents a week, wow. uh, which is about $40 a week now. And that, that was painful to, mm. to do that research, to know what she was like at the end of the book, I put her face on the, on the cover. Um, she, her, her picture was taken by a famous child labor photographer called Lewis Hine, very well known in this country. And she was on a postage stamp. She was in a Nike ad. She was the face of child labor. Her, her, her grandchildren never knew this picture was taken. Wow. So when I was finished with the book, I thought, I can't let that little girl in that picture just go. So I ended up finding her descendants and telling them the whole story. And that, that whole process was fascinating deep and disturbing to think yeah, of the imagine. life she had lived the funny thing was that she died at 93 of lung cancer and i tried to say to her granddaughter well this is probably the mill the textile mill all mm. the stuff that was in the air she said no she smoked six packs a day or something for her whole life but she was amazing but with her very tough beginning she lived to 93. wow that's an incredible wow. story yeah yeah yeah, no, it was amazing. Yeah, it's always fascinating when people are finding out about their ancestry and the history of their family. And um, I did a charity walk a couple of weeks ago, and uh, mm. this historian there, he got in touch with us about uh, my great-grandfather's details from World War I uh, this week. Wow. Um, information that I never even knew about. So it's just wow. really incredible when you're not entirely sure what's happened in the past uh, to then discover it. And obviously writing a memoir about your family we'll get into that right after this but yeah. you know um it, it it must take so much evidence collecting and and memory yeah. re recollection and uh, but what i'll do is i'll play the video so we can talk about it uh, and okay. then uh, we'll do part two of the show guys uh, All right, which is, is what's the story
getting ahead of myself there, trying to jump into the story. Um, Elizabeth, if you can, please let everybody know what Daughter of Spies is all about. Okay, Daughter of Spies is uh, a, I call it a memoir. It's a family history and memoir. Um, and it tells the story of my parents who, my mother was born in Gibraltar, which is a very odd place to be born. My father was American. Um, they met in a Yorkshire, England castle in on August 31st, 1942. My mother was by that time, oh no, a year later, became a decoding agent for MI5. And my father, who was in the British army, switched to the American army and worked with an organization called OSS, which was a spy group. And he dropped behind enemy lines into France um, right after D-Day. The story, these two people married, not really knowing each other very well. My mother was 18 and my father was 30 when they married. And from the beginning, my mother had signed the British Official Secrets Act. She did not tell him where she worked. She said she worked in the passport office. He could not tell her where he was jumping because of course it was a secret. So my premise is, the, the subtitle is Wartime Secrets, Family Lies, because they kept secrets from each other and that became a habit in the marriage. So I follow them through to my childhood, but bra it's a braided narrative, which I've never done before, which means I move back and forth between taking care of my mother who has dementia, mm. trying to get the stories out of her before I lose her, not even physically, but mentally, and telling my own story too, as the child of this mother. So it is a um, people. It is a memoir, family history, and biography, all sort of wrapped into one. Yeah, it's a fascinating. Even from what you just described as absolutely fascinating, and there's so many things in there from the their careers themselves until until you trying to extract that information yourself. There's so many things that are incredible to us, but also very personal to yourself. Yeah. Um, and we spoke about how writing this will be very different to anything you've released before. Um, so how, obviously it was a nerve wracking thing for you, but how did you feel leading up to that release, which a couple of days ago now? Yeah. And how have you now felt since that release? It's, um... I think leading up to the release, because of the way publishing runs these days, you, there's a lot on the author's shoulders in terms of publicity and marketing. I've written a number of guest columns. I've done wonderful interviews with people like yourself. Um, it, it kind of, my head was spinning and I wasn't thinking about it too much. And then bang, Wednesday happened, the pub date. And suddenly I began to get responses. Wow, I read your book. The one that's the hardest is, I sat down and read your book in three hours and I sit there thinking it took me 10 years to write and you're reading it in three hours. Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, but I think that um, I'm still nervous. It's mm -hmm. still hard because there are people who may not like what I've said about them. They're, it's not all a happy-go-lucky story. Um, I think the thing I'm the proudest of, next Wednesday will be 10 years from my mother's death. She died on November 3rd, 2012. And one of her last comments to me, when she had dementia, she said, you're writing my autobiography, which I always loved. And I said, in a way I am. I, I think she, would, she wouldn't be happy about everything I said because I was very honest about the troubles mm -hmm. in, our, in our house. But I think she would agree that it's honest that it is an honest picture of what we all lived with, good and bad. And there were lots of good times. But my father was a famous journalist. He, yeah. he When he wrote, it was 28 million people read him in a day. 28 wow. million. And he had to be gone three to six months a year traveling abroad in order to report. That left my mother in charge of everything. She was a Catholic a devout Catholic, she conceived 12 children. Six of us were born. I had a baby sister who died at three months. My father was away when Alexandra died um, and there were miscarriages. So she really mm. bore the brunt 
of the whole thing. Her, his, his um, reputation was well earned, but a lot of it was on her back to keep everything going so he could just do what he had to do. Yeah, it's an incredible story. <clears throat> and you mentioned there the the kind of um, pressures on the rest of the family and even being an author, there is family sacrifice with that as well. And um, it's just incredible that the, the, the way that that all works out. And so release day uh, last, this Wednesday just gone mm -hmm. is post COVID now. <laughs> Yeah. Um, did hope. you have releases in COVID and and has that compared to kind of this release? Was it much different? Luckily, I did not. I did okay. not have any books come out during COVID. There's still concern, you know, people, mm. I have a number of uh, bookstores I'm going to be in and masks are encouraged, et cetera, et cetera. But it definitely, I have a dear friend who gave me a wonderful quote on this book and hers came out on or more. Her book came out March, 2020. Yeah, And I just, what a thing to try and deal with the whole shift. But I luckily have not had that situation. Yeah. So. It's incredible, isn't it? Um, your book is generally um, focused around the 1950s times in Washington. I mean, mm -hmm. how did you translate that onto the page? Uh, kind of what research did you get into? And, and was that a difficult thing for you? Or did you find that quite entertaining? Well, the interesting thing about it, I've just had a back and forth with my oldest brother because my, here's a perfect example. Um, we are 60 years away from the Cuban Missile Crisis. My father wrote an entire very well-known article about it in which he used the words eyeball to eyeball and hawks mm. and doves. And that all entered the uh, vernacular because of daddy. And so my brother and a historian and I have been on this thread. And my brother Joe said to me, well, Elizabeth, he said, what, uh, what do you remember? You were home. I was away in boarding school. And I said back to him, Joe, don't you get it? Read the book. I said, my mother was eight months pregnant with Alexandra. There was terrible, very high tension in the house. My mother was an alcoholic and I was trying to protect my younger brothers. I have no idea what daddy was doing or writing about. I did, I did notice the bomb shelters and I did do the bomb mm -hmm. drills but that wasn't my focus at the time. That said, the whole atmosphere of Washington in the 1950s, particularly because my father's best friends all worked for the CIA. Hmm. They were in and out of the back door in the living room. When that door was closed, you couldn't get near the living room. There were murmured low voices. Um, there was a whole sense of you've got to get a hold of the secrets because the power comes from the secrets. So we adopted that as children. My brother, my oldest brother was a mechanical genius. We bugged my head, ma uh, my um, father's dinner party. <laughs> and, you know, Joe carried the Wallenstock reel to reel tape recorder into the room, sat it down. Daddy had, had bet him $50. He couldn't do it. Joe hit the play button and daddy got up and peeled off five tens and handed it to him. Wow. He went on to bug the headmaster study in his boarding school. He ran a private telephone line. We tried to put it through the sewers of Washington. So we acted like operatives. And one of the chapters is covert ops, because mm -hmm. that was what we breathed in every day. That whole sense of murky sec secrecy. It was a very it's odd upbringing. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating. And, uh, that, that it was, it's impressive enough to be a lot of secret secrecy in those lifestyles but then to be bugging it as well um <laughs> it, it's i think that's fast, fantastic um there's a review of uh daughter of spies that i'd like to read um mm. and then ask a question off the back of it so it says a fantastic memoir that paints a colorful picture of a place and time in modern history the war uh world of georgetown set is so interesting uh and the author points uh, paints a vivid picture of a family life. Um, there's some fantastic reviews on there, all, all very good mm. rated five stars. Um, and again, it's painting a picture of of those times and and being able to do that. So, what advice would you be able to give someone who is kind of thinking about maybe taking a similar approach and wanting mm. to to look into history to write about? What advice could you give them if they're going down that route? Well, I'd first say it's. Uh, you know, I, every book, even even fiction, requires research. 
Mm. And my whole thing is that the the research for the author should be the iceberg and for the reader should be the tip. So don't sit there hitting the reader over the head with all the work you've done researching. Just give them what they need to know to establish the sense of place and time. It helps to listen to music from that era. It really helps to read newspapers from that time. I had endless photograph albums from my own childhood and my mother's. Um, so all of that fed into trying, and I think being a fiction writer really helped me because I, you know, when you write memoir, you are going to put in dialogue that you obviously can't remember, but you remember the feeling of it. Yeah. So a perfect example is when I turned to my mother at the age of 12 in the car, we were driving in a carpool and I was alone with her. I said, mommy, can I please have a bra? And she said, whatever for dear. So that never left my mind. You know, I mean, I remember that moment so clearly. Did she say exactly those words? No, but it's the spirit of what she said, the spirit of the dialogue. So in a memoir, use dialogue, use description, use history to feed the sense of the place. The setting is crucial, all of that. So really, it is almost like writing a novel. Mm. Treat it. If you're going to write a memoir, treat it like writing a novel, but be as honest as you can about yourself. Don't make everybody else the villain. That that yeah. really smacks off. You have to put the light as hard on yourself, as brightly on yourself as anybody else. Fantastic. So. Uh, Mario uh, is in the chat. He said that she's so right. I did that with Letters from Italy, which is a fantastic biography of his. Of his. And he said, my husband lived in D.C. for 10 plus years. There were lots of su suspected spies <laughs> among his friends. Um, yes. Yeah, I can, I can <laughs> yeah nebulous government jobs. They're always called, you know, the consul or the advisor to the whatever. And, you know, they're all suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Um, so the question is then, now Daughter of Spies is finally out and that m a massive amount of hard work you put into this is mm. now wrapped up and delivered. What What's next for Elizabeth Winthrop? Well, the very funny thing, as I was saying to Chris earlier, is COVID is great for writers. It was great for writers. It gave yeah. us permission to do what we really ought to do, which is stay home and work. So I have been bugged for years to write another castle book. And for some reason that was interesting to me, I decided to write a prequel where it all started. And I, you know, I've heard you talk, Chris, to, to fantasy writers and horror writers about a step, creating a world. In my book, in Castle in the Attic, which was written so long ago that it was before the huge series that they have on fantasy now, like Rick Reardon or those kinds of people, I just thought I was writing one book. So I wrote the book. I wrote a, a world for that book. And then I wrote the second one and I realized wait a minute, there's a villain in the first and a villain in the second. Didn't someone send them? Who's the one who sent them all? Mm. That's why I went back to the prequel. So I have a much bigger world than I had. Yeah. And it's set, it's, it's all of my castle books are time travel books. This one is set on the northeast coast of England near Dunstanburg Castle in 1943. That's the opening. And it goes back to the exact same place in 1366, which is when Dunstanburg Castle had just been built. So wow. you have a boy who looks at a complete ruin in 1943, and he goes back and he looks at the castle that was just finished. So that's been really fun for me and completely different from what I just finished. Yeah. Although because my mother is British, I'm always pulled towards England. Yeah. Have you traveled England much for your research or is there anywhere you'd like to go? I have been, um, in fact, on my website, there is, a, there is literally a pilgrimage. Um, when, I, when I decided to write about my mother's childhood and I knew nothing about where she lived, I went and looked at every single place. And the wow. eeriest thing was I could get into every one of them. For example, she went to a convent north of um, London called Poles, which was in Ware, England. It is now a Hanbury Marriott golf spa. And when my mother died, she left 60,000 
American Express points. So I thought, well, this is how she'd want me to use them. So <laughs> we spent two nights in this spa. And as I said to my husband, we were in an enormous room. And I said, this would have been mummy and seven other girls. The yeah. chapel was still there. The dining room was still there, the library. So I was walking through her teenage years. And then I went to another place where I knew her grandmother had lived. And we found the house and knocked on the door. And the owner said, absolutely, come in. And I stood in my mother's bedroom where she, she had described to me the view. So we were all over. And we went to Yorkshire where my father and mother met. We sat in the dining room chairs in the dining room because now it's a stately home and you can tour it. It was an amazing experience to go through all of that. My mother's only brother was killed in the war the day that my mother met my father. Wow. The exact day, August 31st, 1942. So I never met him, needless to say, he was 21 when he was dive bombed by a Stuka in the battle before El Alamein. And we went to his school and he had taken all these pictures and they were in my mother's desk in negative, they had never been printed. I printed them, I took them to the priests in his Catholic school called Ampleforth, and they just couldn't believe it. They were pictures they had never seen of dormitories, of skating, anyway, it was, that whole trip was an amazing experience. Yeah, sounds fascinating. And of yeah. course, you're a photographer yourself, so those those prints must have been really exciting to have found and, and to develop amazing. and, and yeah. discover the story and that was sat and discovered at the time. Yeah. And as you said, you know, your great grandfather during the war, I mean, things like that. I found pictures that Uncle Ian took in the desert days yeah. before he was shot. So it, I, I love history and I love mm. genealogy and I love the research. My biggest problem is to stop the research and start the writing. Yeah. Because I can get lost in the research. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good thing because it means you're passionate about the research, which means it should reflect rightly in the story. So exactly. that can't be a bad thing at all. No. Yeah, it, it's yeah. always fascinated me to know what's under our feet, what's been before. And there's something really uh, attractive about kind of historical fiction that maybe one day I'll tap into. And, and mm. I think it's something a lot of people kind of really kind of for some reason lean towards. And it's definitely an attraction there. I mean, what about you and your great grandfather? I could see a well, story there. World yeah, War potentially. Uh, yeah. World War One. Uh, before, oh, it yeah. was World War One. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It was. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So I had just come back from touring, well, touring, doing a 100 kilometer charity walk in France Good and Belgium you. along the Western Front of World War One. So it was, it was wow. the stories we got from the historian there were just unbelievable. And, just the evidence left in the ground, what we could see uh, reflecting the stories that we were told, it, that opens your mind up to a whole world of story and, and characters that you just you just didn't know. We, you, didn't, you know about loosely, but you don't really know about. And that makes exactly. me want to write about that time. You know, it's, um, yeah. you know, our past is amazing and uh, should be not forgotten and obviously exactly. researched as best as we can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Okay, so we're going to go into the final part of the show, which is part three, okay. and that is community questions. So if you guys are watching, okay. have any questions for Elizabeth, for myself, or for both of us, now is the time to send them into the chat, and I will put them on screen as long as they're uh, nice to do so. And I will ask Elizabeth our staple questions right after this video. Okay, so Elizabeth, um, uh, just before I do get into some questions, I did mention that you you're into photography, but you also mentioned knitting, and uh, I'm seeing on your website gardening as well. So there's quite a mm -hmm. few hobbies there alongside your writing. Um, That's true. When it comes to kind of painting and, and photography, these are all very creative things, along as you're writing as well and knitting. Is there is there one of those hobbies that's particularly like a favorite of yours above the others? The one I can do while I write is knit. The okay. other, because because I follow patterns. I'm not a, a creative knitter in that I'm not just, you know, uh, creating, painting with wool, as I say mm. about one of my characters. But the others, particularly um, the photography and the painting or the sketching, 
that's when I am not writing. It's like the creative spirit goes into the words. And if I'm taking a break from the words, what even if I'm just writing in my journal or whatever, then I can do the other. But I find I can't do them both at the same time. Mm. It's very much like I couldn't teach and write at the same time. It's sucked from the same well, you know, or <laughs> maybe that's the wrong word, but whatever. It, it, it pulled from the same place. And when I'm deep into a book, I don't want anything to take from that drive. You know how hard it is to get up and sit mm. down and write every day. I mean, nobody's asking for this. Nobody's saying, why haven't you finished that book? I can't wait to read it. Well, I'm not Stephen King. So nobody's asking me that question. So you really have to be a self-starter. Mm. And for me, if I'm deep in the book, then don't distract myself with, <laughs> oh, I'm going to go paint this painting or sketch. So. You mentioned before about finding the right time to write in the day. Uh, mm -hmm. What is your time? Are you a morning writer, an evening or a night writer? What, what's your kind of time? I'm a, I'm a get up and have breakfast, sometimes across the street at the city diner, which I love. Nice. And then I write from about 9.30 to 1. That's my okay. best writing time. And after that, it's business. You know, royalties, yeah. uh, touring, all the other business stuff. Yeah. Um, but I'm a morning writer. Yeah, definitely. Um, we do have a question from Mary who's just come in, but I'll, I'll leave that for a second. Um, okay, so if you could take a character from the world of fiction and mm -hmm. perhaps put that into one of your stories or develop a new story or even take them out for the day in the real world, what fictional character would you kind of adapt and why? It's funny, but I think it would be Uriah Heep from David Copperfield. He is the most unctuous, awful, slimy, smarmy person that I can imagine. And I'm not good at that. When I write my villains, I tend to see the other side. That's so funny. yes, they are villainous, but there's a little villain in me too. I mean, <laughs> when uh, in the castle in the attic, there's a villain named Alastor who turns everybody to lead. And let me tell you, there are people I would like to turn to lead, you know, <laughs> so, so I can relate to Alastor. But with with Uriah Heep, there's nothing nice about him. And I would mm. love to try and work with a character that he isn't one dimensional. He's got a lot mm. of dimension because he's so unctuous. But um, and he get and he's so manipulative and you so want him to get his comeuppance. But it would be fun to try and write a character like that. So, yeah. do you think you put that into one of your stories, or just work with them separately? Would he fit into one of yours? I w I think that he would fit into mm. one of the castle books. I could definitely okay. see one of the castle books. Whereas my villain that I've just written about in the first castle book is uh, a a very a child who was almost drowned at birth. So she's raging, revengeful, but you can understand why, you know, yeah. that's always my problem is that as a character developer, I'm always looking at both sides of the character. So amazing. Yeah. yeah brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you could take the ending of anything, whether it be TV, film, mm. uh, novels and change the ending, what ending are you going to change and why? Aye, aye, aye. A tough, tough question. Well, I would have Charlotte live in Charlotte's web. The spider, <laughs> don't do that to Wilbur. That is the worst thing that E.B. White could do, get rid of Charlotte. I don't care that she had a million babies and he made that be okay. I don't think that's okay. Spiders live a long time. Let Charlotte live. Now, it wouldn't be as good a book, I don't think. Um, but, you know, the structure of a book, they mm. always say it goes, you, you know, you go up and a little up and a little up and then down. And then there's a little up at the bottom. Well, the down is when Charlotte dies. Yeah. And the little up at the bottom is that she has a million babies. So, I mean, he's following the correct fictional mm. structure. But I'm, as a reader, furious. Wilbur's all alone. He doesn't, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So mm. I guess that's the ending I would change. I caught Funny someone one. chatting about uh, Romeo and Juliet the other day as well, talking ah. about the ending there. And they were yeah. discussing how they think that ending should have been slightly different. Do you agree with that or not? They it's both a tough died, one, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. 
Well, you wouldn't want that... one of them to outlast the other. I think they both because have it's to just survive. as bad, right? If if yeah. one of them had survived, then yeah, exactly. I think they both <laughs> have to go, or they both have to live, yeah. <laughs> and then you don't have much of a story. Except they could go chasing across the landscape with you know someone always yeah. behind them. I mean, if they did both survive, what would that end up being anyway? Just kind of a weird. Uh, yeah. Anyway, there you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Mario's got a question. Thank you, Mario. He says, "How do you feel about historical fiction?" I'm considering writing a story based on my great grandfather, but don't have enough uh, for nonfiction. I think it's a great idea. It's it's why I did Counting on Grace. I thought it would be nonfiction, and then I realized I don't know enough, but I can invent a lot. Um, and I loved writing that book. Um, so I would definitely uh, do all the research on the on the grandfather, the great grandfather. I mean, that's what I spent miles hours doing my mm. my mother died in 2012 and although i had been in the spelunking as i say it in the basement in the end we found and i had scanned 3900 documents now the fact that my great grandfather my great great uncle was theodore roosevelt we could not just go in there and throw out a box and it turned out we found original letters from him we found a rich so it was important to do it very carefully, but it also really revealed who she, where she came from. Her mm. grandfather was knighted by the Duke of Cornwall in, in Gibraltar. You know, it was very, uh, an amazing background that she had always been very quiet about. So I would highly recommend Mario go for the historical fiction and have a yeah. blast. It's really fun. Isn't it amazing how people of the past who achieved incredible things are often the ones who are really quiet about it? You exactly. know, they don't open up and tell people about their stories. They just sit there quietly and it's there in the background. But yeah, it, it seems to always be the way that those <clears throat> often, especially when we look back at the wars, the people who go through above and beyond and do heroic things never are discuss the quietest. it. Yeah. Mm. Are the quietest about it. Yeah. Yeah, um, I would agree. I'm guessing that's Italian from Mario. <laughs> yes, thank you. A million thanks. Thank you, Mario. <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay, so a couple of minutes left. What I'll do is have a little look, see what we've got. Um, okay, what was the last book you read or film that you watched? The last book I read is, um, can I pick the, yes, I finished one last night by Shirley Jackson called We Have Always Lived in the Castle. Absolutely mm. hair-raising. Shirley Jackson is the author from, she lived in North Bennington, Vermont, which is close to where I spend the summer. And she wrote a very famous short story in America called The Lottery, where the town puts every year, decides which of their citizens is going to be killed. Wow. And this one, We Have Always Lived in the Castle, is a story about a small town in a New England and the way the townspeople turn against one family, particularly one child. And it is, it's hair raising. Um, mm. I don't know if there's ever been a movie of it. It, I, it should be. It, it, it's a it sounds like a great thing. movie, yeah. Yeah, it's a perfect story about small town living. And I wrote a novel called Island Justice, and it was all about the kind of justice that year-round people on a small island in the winter perpetrate on one another. They don't ever want anybody from the outside. We'll take care of it. That's very much what this this is like, this book. Wow. Sounds amazing. Uh, another link to a castle there. You seem to like castles. Yeah, I know. I seem to yeah. like that one, we, are... have, we have always lived in the castle. It's actually a house. It's not a yeah. castle. But the town There's lots of those think. in Wales. You should come and see yes. them. I should come see them. <laughs> okay. Uh, just so we can wrap up with this then, um, I'm going to ask, when you're looking further down the line back at your career, what will literary success look like for you? What do you, When you look back, what do you think, I'm happy with this as success, what have I achieved now? Wow. <laughs> I think that this book is a real moment for me. It's a real, I did write an earlier novel called Knock Knock Who's There about two boys whose father dies of a blood disease and after he dies, they decide, they discover their mother is an alcoholic. 
-hmm. My father died of a blood disease and my mother was an alcoholic. And that was a really tough book for me to write and for my mother to read, as you can imagine. This one, I feel like, although it's very honest about the bad times, it's also very honest about how incredibly brave she was, how um, persevering she was. She was young when my father died. Um, so I feel like I have, I have told her story as it needed to be told. So yeah. it will be a real Waterloo for me or whatever mm. the word is. Yeah. I can imagine with it being such a long process for you as well, to, to have this wrapped up and delivered now is, is a huge yeah. weight off huge. your shoulders. Mm. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Well, congratulations to you. I, I mean, that's a wonderful achievement. Um, just before we finish then, where can people find Daughter of Spies and where can they find out more about you? elizabethwinthrop.com or elizabethwinthropalsip.com. There's lots of material there. And Daughter of Spies you can get on amazon.uk. And you can also go to your local independent bookstore and ask them to order it. It's available in all English speaking countries. So it is yeah. available there too. And I'd love to have it bought through an independent bookseller. Definitely support your local booksellers. That's the yes. way to do it. Um, fantastic, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. And before I do forget, guys, um, if you can't find those links very quickly, if you look in the description of the show, the podcast and the YouTube video, there will be the links to the website and the book as well. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining me. Don't worry about that. Technical difficulties. I'll cut Sorry. That out. Not a problem. Um, <laughs> okay. And it happens to us all. Uh, but thank Great. you so much for joining me. Honestly, it's been an absolute blast. Your stories are incredible. And um, I'm definitely going to look into this story. Um, there's so much history there. It's so There's so many things going on. It's incredible. So thank you for sharing your story with us. And um, I look forward to, to what the future brings to you as well. So thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you for, for you guys tuning in. Thank um, you, Chris. Goodbye, uh, and we'll see you all soon. Two weeks' time, guys. Season ten, incredible, uh, big surprise coming up. So tune in for that, and um, I'll see you in two weeks. Take care of yourselves. Happy Halloween, and look after mm. yourselves. Bye, bye, guys. <laughs>